Section zero of a short history of Greek philosophy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A short history of Greek philosophy by John Marshall. Preface. The main purpose which I have had in view in writing this book has been to present an account of Greek philosophy which, within strict limits of brevity, shall be at once authentic and interesting authentic as being based on the original works themselves and not on any secondary sources interesting as presenting to the ordinary english reader in language freed as far as possible from technicality and abstruseness the great thoughts of the greatest men of antiquity on questions of permanent significance and value there has been no attempt to shirk the really philosophic problems which these men tried in their day to solve but i have endeavoured to show by a sympathetic treatment of them that these problems were no mere wars of words but that in fact the philosophers of twenty-four centuries ago were dealing with exactly similar difficulties as to the basis of belief and of right action as under different forms beset thoughtful men and women today in the general treatment of the subject i have followed in the main the order and drawn chiefly on the selection of passages in ritter and preller's historia philosophiae graecae it is hoped that in this way the little book may be found useful at the universities as a running commentary on that excellent work and the better to aid students in the use of it for that purpose the corresponding sections in ritter and preller are indicated by the figures in the margin in the sections on plato and occasionally elsewhere i have drawn to some extent by the kind permission of the delegates of the clarendon press and his own on professor jowett's great commentary and translation john marshall end of section zero section one of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. The School of Miletus 1. Thales For several centuries prior to the great Persian invasions of Greece, perhaps the very greatest and wealthiest city of the Greek world was Miletus. Situated about the centre of the Ionian coasts of Asia Minor, with four magnificent harbours and a strongly defensible position, it gathered to itself much of the great overland trade, which has flowed for thousands of years eastward and westward between india and the mediterranean while by its great fleets it created a new world of its own along the black sea coast its colonies there were so numerous that miletus was named mother of eighty cities from abydus on the bosphorus past sinope and so onward to the crimea and the don and thence round to thrace a busy community of colonies mining manufacturing shipbuilding corn raising owned miletus for their mother city its marts must therefore have been crowded with merchants of every country from india to spain from arabia to russia the riches and wonders of every clime must have become familiar to its inhabitants and fitly enough therefore in this city was born the first notable greek geographer the first constructor of a map the first observer of natural and other curiosities the first recorder of varieties of custom among various communities the first speculator on the causes of strange phenomena hecateus his work is in great part lost but we know a good deal about it from the frequent references to him and it in the work of his rival and follower herodotus the city naturally held a leading place politically as well as commercially empire in our sense was alien to the instincts of the greek race but miletus was for centuries recognized as the foremost member of a great commercial and political league the political character of the league becoming more defined as first the lydian and then the persian monarchy became an aggressive neighbor on its borders it was in this active prosperous enterprising state and at the period of its highest activity that thales statesman practical engineer mathematician philosopher flourished without attempting to fix his date too closely we may take it that he was a leading man in miletus for the greater part of the first half of the sixth century before christ we hear of an eclipse predicted by him of the course of a river usefully changed of shrewd and profitable handling of the market of wise advice in the general councils of the league he seems to have been at once a student of mathematics and an observer of nature and withal something having analogy with both an inquirer or speculator into the origin of things to us nowadays this suggests a student of geology or physiography or some such branch of physical science to thales it probably rather suggested a theoretical inquiry into the simplest thinkable aspect of things as existing under what form known to us he would seem to have asked may we assume an identity in all known things so as best to cover or render explicable the things as we know them the beginning of things for it was thus he described this assumed identity was not conceived by him as something which was long ages before 
and which had ceased to be rather it meant the reality of things now thales then was the putter of a question which had not been asked expressly before but which has never ceased to be asked since he was also the formulator of a new meaning for a word the word beginning greek arche got the meaning of underlying reality and so of ending as well in short he so dealt with the word on the surface of it implying time as to eliminate the idea of time and suggest a method of looking at the world more profound and far-reaching than had been before imagined it is interesting to find that the man who was thus the first philosopher the first observer who took a metaphysical non-temporal analytical view of the world and so became the predecessor of all those votaries of other world ways of thinking whether as academic idealist or budge doctor of the stoic fur or christian ascetic or what not whose ways are such a puzzle to the hard-headed practical man was himself one of the shrewdest men of his day so shrewd that by common consent he was placed foremost in antiquity among the seven sages or seven shrewd men whose practical wisdom became a world's tradition enshrined in anecdote and crystallized in proverb the chief record that we possess of the philosophic teaching of thales is contained in an interesting notice of earlier philosophies by aristotle the main part of which as regards thales runs as follows the early philosophers as a rule formulated the originative principle greek arche of all things under some material expression by the originative principle or element of things they meant that of which all existing things are composed that which determines their coming into being and into which they pass on ceasing to be where these philosophers differed from each other was simply in the answer which they gave to the question what was the nature of this principle the differences of view among them applying both to the number and to the character of the supposed element or elements thales the pioneer of this philosophy maintained that water was the originative principle of all things it was doubtless in this sense that he said that the earth rested on water what suggested the conception to him may have been such facts of observation as that all forms of substance which promote life are moist that heat itself seems to be conditioned by moisture that the life producing seed in all creatures is moist and so on other characteristics of water it is elsewhere suggested may have been in thales mind such as its readiness to take various shapes its convertibility from water into vapor or ice its ready mixture with other substances and so forth what we have chiefly to note is that the more unscientific this theory about the universe may strike us as being the more completely out of accord with facts now familiar to everybody the more striking is it as marking a new mood of mind in which unity though only very partially suggested or discoverable by the senses is preferred to that infinite and indefinite variety and difference which the senses give us at every moment there is here the germ of a new aspiration of a determination not to rest in the merely momentary and different but at least to try even against the apparent evidence of the senses for something more permanently intelligible as a first suggestion of what this permanent underlying reality may be water might very well pass it is probable that even to thales himself it was only a symbol like the figure in a mathematical proposition representing by the first passable physical phenomenon which came to hand that ideal reality underlying all change which is at once the beginning the middle and the end of all that he did not mean water in the ordinary prosaic sense to be identical with this is suggested by some other sayings of his thales says aristotle elsewhere thought the whole universe was full of gods all things he is recorded as saying have a soul in them in virtue of which they move other things and are themselves moved even as the magnet by virtue of its life or soul moves the iron without pushing these fragmentary utterances too far we may well conclude that whether thales spoke of the soul of the universe and its divine indwelling powers or gods or of water as the origin of things he was only vaguely symbolizing in different ways an idea as yet formless and void like the primeval chaos but nevertheless like it containing within it a promise and a potency of greater life hereafter two anaximander our information with respect to thinkers so remote as these men is too scanty and too fragmentary to enable us to say in what manner or degree they influenced each other we cannot say for certain that any one of them was pupil or antagonist of another they appear each of them one might say for a moment only from amidst the darkness of antiquity a few sayings of theirs we catch vaguely across the void and then they disappear there is not consequently any very distinct progression or continuity observable among them and so far therefore one has to confess that the title school of miletus is a misnomer we have already quoted the words of aristotle in which he classes the ionic philosophers together 
as all of them giving a material aspect of some kind to the originative principle of the universe but while this is a characteristic observable in some of them it is not so obviously discoverable in the second of their number anaximander this philosopher is said to have been younger by one generation than thales but to have been intimate with him he like thales was a native of miletus and while we do not hear of him as a person like thales of political eminence and activity he was certainly the equal if not the superior of thales in mathematical and scientific ability he is said to have either invented or at least made known to greece the construction of the sundial he was associated with hecateus in the construction of the earliest geographical charts or maps he devoted himself with some success to the science of astronomy his familiarity with the abstractions of mathematics perhaps accounts for the more abstract form in which he expressed his idea of the principle of all things to anaximander this principle was as he expressed it the infinite not water nor any other of the so-called elements but a different thing from any of them something hardly nameable out of whose formlessness the heavens and all the worlds in them came to be and by necessity into that same infinite or indefinite existence out of which they originally emerged did every created thing return thus as he poetically expressed it time brought its revenges and for the wrongdoing of existence all things paid the penalty of death the momentary resting place of thales on the confines of the familiar world of things in his formulation of water as the principle of existence is thus immediately removed we get as it were to the earliest conception of things as we find it in genesis before the heavens were or earth or the waters under the earth or light or sun or moon or grass or the beast of the field when the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep only be it observed that while in the primitive biblical idea this formless void precedes in time an ordered universe in anaximander's conception this formless infinitude is always here is in fact the only reality which ever is here something without beginning or ending underlying all enwrapping all governing all to modern criticism this may seem to be little better than verbiage having perhaps some possibilities of poetic treatment but certainly very unsatisfactory if regarded as science but to this we have to reply that one is not called upon to regard it as science behind science as much today when our knowledge of the details of phenomena is so enormously increased as in the times when science had hardly begun there lies a world of mystery which we cannot pierce and yet which we are compelled to assume no scientific treatise can begin without assuming matter and force as data and however much we may have learned about the relations of forces and the affinities of things matter and force as such remain very much the same dim infinities that the originative infinite was to anaximander it is to be noted however that while modern science assumes necessarily two correlative data or originative principles force namely as well as matter anaximander seems to have been content with the formulation of but one and perhaps it is just here that a kinship still remains between him and thales and other philosophers of the school he no more than they seems to have definitely raised the question how are we to account for or formulate the principle of difference or change what is it that causes things to come into being out of or recalls them back from being into the infinite void it is to be confessed however that our accounts on this point are somewhat conflicting one authority actually says that he formulated motion as eternal also so far as he attempted to grasp the idea of difference in relation to that of unity he seems to have regarded the principle of change or difference as inhering in the infinite itself aristotle in this connection contrasts his doctrine with that of anaxagoras who formulated two principles of existence matter and mind anaximander he points out found all he wanted in the one as a mathematician anaximander must have been familiar in various aspects with the functions of the infinite or indefinable in the organization of thought to the student of euclid for example the impossibility of adequately defining any of the fundamental elements of the science of geometry the point the line the surface is a familiar fact in so far as a science of geometry is possible at all the exactness which is its essential characteristic is only attainable by starting from data which are in themselves impossible as of a point which has no magnitude of a line which has no breadth of a surface which has no thickness so in the science of abstract number the fundamental assumptions as that one equals one x equals x etc are contradicted by every fact of experience for in the world as we know it absolute equality is simply impossible to discover 
and yet these fundamental conceptions are in their development most powerful instruments for the extension of man's command over his own experiences their completeness of abstraction from the accidents of experience from the differences qualifications variations which contribute so largely to the personal interests of life this it is which makes the abstract sciences demonstrative exact and universally applicable in so far therefore as we are permitted to grasp the conception of a perfectly abstract existence prior to and underlying and enclosing all separate existences so far also do we get to a conception which is demonstrative exact and universally applicable throughout the whole world of knowable objects such a conception however by its absolute emptiness of content does not afford any means in itself of progression somehow and somewhere a principle of movement of development of concrete reality must be found or assumed to link this ultimate abstraction of existence to the multifarious phenomena of existence as known and it was perhaps because anaximander failed to work out this aspect of the question that in the subsequent leaders of the school movement rather than mere existence was the principle chiefly insisted upon before passing however to these successors of anaximander some opinions of his which we have not perhaps the means of satisfactorily correlating with his general conception but which are not without their individual interest may here be noted the word husk or bark greek floios seems to have been a favourite one with him as implying and depicting a conception of interior and necessary development in things thus he seems to have postulated an inherent tendency or law in the infinite which compelled it to develop contrary characters as hot and cold dry and moist in consequence of this fundamental tendency an envelope of fire he says came into being encircling another envelope of air which latter in turn enveloped the sphere of earth each being like the husk of the other or like the bark which encloses the tree this concentric system he conceives as having in some way been parted up into various systems represented by the sun the moon the stars and the earth the last he figured as hanging in space and deriving its stability from the inherent and perfect balance or relation of its parts then again as to the origin of man he seems to have in like manner taught a theory of development from lower forms of life in his view the first living creatures must have come into being in moisture thus recalling the theory of thales as time went on and these forms of life reached their fuller possibilities they came to be transferred to the dry land casting off their old nature like a husk or bark more particularly he insists that man must have developed out of other and lower forms of life because of his exceptional need under present conditions of care and nursing in his earlier years had he come into being at once as a human creature he could never have survived the analogies of these theories with modern speculations are obvious and interesting but without enlarging on these one has only to say in conclusion that suggestive and interesting as many of these poor fragments these disjecti membra poetae are individually they leave us more and more impressed with a sense of incompleteness in our knowledge of anaximander's theory as a whole it may be that as a consistent and perfected system the theory never was worked out it may be that it never was properly understood by some authorities it is stated that anaximander the second philosopher of this school was the first to use the word arche in the philosophic sense whether this be so or not thales certainly had the idea End of section one. Section two of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. The School of Miletus. Concluded. Three. Anaximenes. This philosopher was also a native of Miletus and is said to have been a hearer or pupil of Anaximander. As we have said, the tendency of the later members of the school was towards emphasizing the motive side of the supposed underlying principle of nature, and accordingly Anaximenes chose air as the element which best represented or symbolized that principle. Its fluidity, readiness of movement, wide extension, and absolute neutrality of character as regards color, taste, smell, form, etc., were obvious suggestions. The breath also, whose very name to the ancients implied an identity with the life or soul, was nothing but air and the identification of air with life supplied just that principle of productiveness and movement which was felt to be necessary in the primal element of being the process of existence then he conceived as consisting in a certain concentration of this diffused life-giving element into more or less solidified forms and the ultimate separation and expansion of these back into the formless air again 
the contrary forces previously used by anaximander heat and cold drought and moisture are with anaximenes also the agencies which institute these changes this is pretty nearly all that we know of anaximenes so far as the few known facts reveal him we can hardly say that except as supplying a step towards the completer development of the motive idea in being he greatly adds to the chain of progressive thought four heraclitus although not a native of miletus but of ephesus heraclitus both by his nationality as an ionian and by his position in the development of philosophic conceptions falls naturally to be classed with the philosophers of miletus his period may be given approximately as from about 560 to 500 BC, although others place him a generation later. Few authentic particulars have been preserved of him. We hear of extensive travels, of his return to his native city only to refuse a share in its activities, of his retirement to a hermit's life. He seems to have formed a contrast to the preceding philosophers in his greater detachment from the ordinary interests of civic existence and much in his teaching suggests the ascetic if not the misanthrope he received the nickname of the obscure from the studied mystery in which he was supposed to involve his teaching he wrote not for the vulgar but for the gifted few much learning makes not wise was the motto of his work the man of gift of insight that man is better than ten thousand he was savage in his criticism of other writers even the greatest homer he said and archilochus too deserved to be hooted from the platform and thrashed even the main purport of his writings was differently interpreted some named his work the muses as though it were chiefly a poetic vision others named it the sure steersman to the goal of life others more prosaically a treatise of nature the fundamental principle or fact of being heraclitus formulated in the famous dictum all things pass in the eternal flux or flow of being consisted its reality even as in a river the water is ever changing and the river exists as a river only in virtue of this continual change or as in a living body wherein while there is life there is no stability or fixedness stability and fixedness are the attributes of the unreal image of life not of life itself thus as will be observed from the material basis of being as conceived by thales with only a very vague conception of the counter principle of movement philosophy has wheeled round in heraclitus to the other extreme he finds his permanent element in the negation of permanence being or reality consists in never being but always becoming not in stability but in change this eternal movement he pictures elsewhere as an eternal strife of opposites whose differences nevertheless consummate themselves in finest harmony thus oneness emerges out of multiplicity multiplicity out of oneness and the harmony of the universe is of contraries as of the lyre and the bow war is the father and king and lord of all things neither god nor man presided at the creation of anything that is that which was is that which is and that which ever shall be even an ever-living fire ever kindling and ever being extinguished thus in fire as an image or symbol of the underlying reality of existence heraclitus advanced to the furthest limit attainable on physical lines for the expression of its essentially motive character that this fire was no more than a symbol suggested by the special characteristics of fire in nature its subtlety its mobility its power of penetrating all things and devouring all things its powers for beneficence in the warmth of living bodies and the life-giving power of the sun is seen in the fact that he readily varies his expression for this principle calling it at times the thunderbolt at others the eternal reason or law or fate to his mental view creation was a process eternally in action the fiery element descending by the law of its being into the cruder forms of water and earth only to be resolved again by upward process into fire even as one sees the vapour from the sea ascending and melting into the ether as a kindred vapour or exhalation he recognised the soul or breath for a manifestation of the essential element it is formless ever changing with every breath we take yet it is the constructive and unifying force which keeps the body together and conditions its life and growth at this point heraclitus comes into touch with anaximenes in the act of breathing we draw into our own being a portion of the all-pervading vital element of all being in this universal being we thereby live and move and have our consciousness the eternal and omnipresent wisdom becomes through the channels of our senses and especially through the eyes in fragments at least our wisdom in sleep we are not indeed cut off wholly from this wisdom 
through our breathing we hold as it were to its root but of its flower we are then deprived on awaking again we begin once more to partake according to our full measure of the living thought even as coals when brought near the fire are themselves made partakers of it but when taken away become quenched hence in so far as man is wise it is because his spirit is kindled by union with the universal spirit but there is a baser or as heraclitus termed it a moister element also in him which is the element of unreason as in a drunken man and thus the trustworthiness or otherwise of the senses as the channels of communication with the divine depends on the dryness or moistness or as we should express it using after all only another metaphor on the elevation or baseness of the spirit that is within to those whose souls are base and barbarous the eternal movement the living fire is invisible and thus what they do see is nothing but death immersed in the mere appearances of things and their supposed stability they whether sleeping or waking behold only dead forms their spirits are dead for the guidance of life there is no law but the common sense which is the union of those fragmentary perceptions of eternal law which individual men attain in so far as their spirits are dry and pure of absolute knowledge human nature is not capable but only the divine to the eternal therefore alone all things are good and beautiful and just because to him alone do things appear in their totality to the human partial reason some things are unjust and others just hence life by reason of the limitations involved in it we sometimes spoke of as the death of the soul and death as the renewal of its life and so in the great events of man's life and in the small as in the mighty circle of the heavens good and evil life and death growth and decay are but the systole and diastole the outward and inward pulsation of an eternal good an eternal harmony day and night winter and summer war and peace satiety and hunger each conditions the other all are part of god it is sickness that makes health good and sweet hunger that gives its pleasure to feeding weariness that makes sleep a good this vision of existence in its eternal flux and interchange seems to have inspired heraclitus with a contemplative melancholy in the traditions of later times he was known as the weeping philosopher lucian represents him as saying to me it is a sorrow that there is nothing fixed or secure and that all things are thrown confusedly together so that pleasure and pain knowledge and ignorance the great and the small are the same ever circling round and passing one into the other in the sport of time time he says elsewhere is like a child that plays with the dice the highest good therefore for mortals is that clarity of perception in respect of oneself and all that is whereby we shall learn to apprehend somewhat of the eternal unity and harmony that underlies the good and evil of time the shock and stress of circumstance and place the highest virtue for man is a placid and a quiet constancy whatever the changes and chances of life may bring it is the pantheistic apathy the sadder note of humanity the note of euripides and at times of sophocles the note of dante and of the tempest of shakespeare of shelley and arnold and carlyle this note we hear thus early and thus clear in the dim and distant utterances of heraclitus the mystery of existence the unreality of what seems most real the intangibility and evanescence of all things earthly these thoughts obscurely echoing to us across the ages from heraclitus have remained and always will remain among the deepest and most insistent of the world's thoughts in its sincerest moments and in its greatest thinkers end of section two section three of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three pythagoras and the pythagoreans the birthplace of pythagoras is uncertain he is generally called the samian and we know at all events that he lived for some time in that island during or immediately before the famous tyranny of polycrates all manner of legends are told of the travels of pythagoras to egypt chaldea phoenicia and even to india others tell of a mysterious initiation at the sacred cave of jupiter in crete and of a similar ceremony at the delphic oracle what is certain is that at some date towards the end of the sixth century b c he removed to southern italy which was then extensively colonized by greeks and that there he became a great philosophic teacher and ultimately even a predominating political influence he instituted a school in the strictest sense with its various grades of learners subject for years to a vow of silence holding all things in common and admitted according to their approved fitness to successive revelations of the true doctrine of the master 
those in the lower grades were called listeners those in the higher mathematicians or students those in the most advanced stage physicists or philosophers with the political relations of the school we need not here concern ourselves in crotona and many other greek cities in italy pythagoreans became a predominant aristocracy who having learned obedience under their master applied what they had learned in an anti-democratic policy of government this lasted for some thirty years but ultimately democracy gains the day and pythagoreanism as a political power was violently rooted out returning to the philosophy of pythagoras in its relation to the general development of greek theory we may note to begin with that it is not necessary or perhaps possible to disentangle the theory of pythagoras himself from that of his followers philolaus and others the teaching was largely oral and was developed by successive leaders of the school the doctrine therefore is generally spoken of as that not of pythagoras but of the pythagoreans nor can we fix for certain on one fundamental conception upon which the whole structure of their doctrine was built one dictum we may start with because of its analogies with what has been said of the earlier philosophies the universe said the pythagoreans was constituted of indefinites and definers that is of that which has no character but has infinite capacities of taking a character and secondly of things or forces which impose a character upon this out of the combination of these two elements or principles all knowable existences come into being all things they said as known have number and this number has two natures the odd and the even the known thing is the odd even or a union of the two by a curious and somewhat fanciful development of this conception the pythagoreans drew up two parallel columns of antithetical principles in nature ten in each thus definite indefinite odd even one many right left male female steadfast moving straight bent light dark good evil four square irregular looking down these two lists we shall see that the first covers various aspects of what is conceived as the ordering defining formative principle in nature and that the second in like manner comprises various aspects of the unordered neutral passive or disorganized element or principle the first to adopt a later method of expression is form the second matter how this antithesis was worked out by plato and aristotle we shall see later on while in a sense then even the indefinite has number inasmuch as it is capable of having number or order imposed upon it and only in so far as it has this imposed upon it does it become knowable or intelligible yet as a positive factor number belongs only to the first class as such it is the source of all knowledge and of all good in reality the pythagoreans had not got any further by this representation of nature than was reached for example by anaximander and still more definitely by heraclitus when they posited an indefinite or infinite principle in nature which by the clash of innate antagonisms developed into a knowable universe but one can easily imagine that once the idea of number became associated with that of the knowable in things a wide field of detailed development and experiment so to speak in the arcana of nature seemed to be opened every arithmetical or geometrical theorem became in this view another window giving light into the secret heart of things number became a kind of god a revealer and the philosophy of number a kind of religion or mystery and this is why the second grade of disciples were called mathematicians mathematics was the essential preparation for and initiation into philosophy whether that which truly exists was actually identical with number or numbers or whether it was something different from number but had a certain relation to number whether if there were such a relation this was merely a relation of analogy or of conformability or whether number were something actually embodied in that which truly exists these were speculative questions which were variously answered by various teachers and which probably interested the later more than the earlier leaders of the school a further question arose assuming that ultimately the elements of knowable existence are but two the one or definite and the manifold or indefinite it was argued by some that there must be some third or higher principle governing the relations of these there must be some law or harmony which shall render their intelligible union possible this principle of union was god ever living ever one eternal immovable self-identical this was the supreme reality the odd even or many in one one in many in whom was gathered up as in an eternal harmony all the contrarieties of lower existence 
through the interchange and intergrowth of these contrarieties god realizes himself the universe in its evolution is the self-picturing of god god is diffused as the seminal principle throughout the universe he is the soul of the world and the world itself is god in process the world therefore is in a sense a living creature at its heart and circumference are purest fire between these circle the sun the moon and the five planets whose ordered movements as of seven chords produce an eternal music the music of the spheres earth too like the planets is a celestial body moving like them around the central fire by analogy with this conception of the universe as the realization of god so also the body whether of man or of any creature is the realization for the time being of a soul without the body and the life of the body that soul were a blind and fleeting ghost of such unrealized souls there are many in various degrees and states the whole air indeed is full of spirits who are the causes of dreams and omens thus the change and flux that are visible in all else are visible also in the relations of soul and body multitudes of fleeting ghosts or spirits are continually seeking realization through union with bodies passing at birth into this one and that and at death issuing forth again into the void like wax which takes now one impression now another yet remains in itself ever the same so souls vary in the outward form that envelops and realizes them in this bodily life the pythagoreans are elsewhere described as saying we are as it were in bonds or in a prison whence we may not justly go forth till the lord calls us this idea cicero mistranslated with a truly roman fitness according to him they taught that in this life we are as sentinels at our post who may not quit it till our commander orders on the one hand therefore the union of soul with body was necessary for the realization of the former greek soma body being as it were greek sema expression even as the reality of god was not in the odd or eternal unity but in the odd even the unity in multiplicity on the other hand this union implied a certain loss or degradation in other words in so far as the soul became realized it also became corporealized subject to the influence of passion and change in a sense therefore the soul as realized was double in itself it partook of the eternal reason as associated with body it belonged to the realm of unreason this disruption of the soul into two the pythagoreans naturally developed in time into a threefold division pure thought perception and desire or even more nearly approaching the platonic division they divided into reason passion and desire but the later developments were largely influenced by platonic and other doctrines and need not be further followed here music had great attractions for pythagoras not only for its soothing and refining effects but for the intellectual interest of its numerical relations reference has already been made to their quaint doctrine of the music of the spheres and the same idea of rhythmic harmony pervaded the whole system the life of the soul was a harmony the virtues were perfect numbers and the influence of music on the soul was only one instance among many of the harmonious relations of things throughout the universe thus we have pythagoras described as soothing mental afflictions and bodily ones also by rhythmic measure and by song with the morning's dawn he would be astir harmonizing his own spirit to his lyre and chanting ancient hymns of the cretan thales of homer and of hesiod till all the tremors of his soul were calmed and still night and morning also he prescribed for himself and his followers an examination as it were a tuning and testing of oneself at these times especially was it meet for us to take account of our soul and its doings in the evening to ask wherein have i transgressed what done what failed to do in the morning what must i do wherein repair past days forgetfulness but the first duty of all was truth truth to one's own highest truth to the highest beyond us through truth alone could the soul approach the divine falsehood was of the earth the real life of the soul must be in harmony with the heavenly and eternal verities pythagoreanism remained a power for centuries throughout the greek world and beyond all subsequent philosophies borrowed from it as it in its later developments borrowed from them and thus along with them it formed the mind of the world for further apprehensions and yet more authentic revelations of divine order and moral excellence end of section three section four of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Chapter Four, The Eleatics. One, Xenophanes. Xenophanes was a native of Colophon, one of the Ionian cities of Asia Minor, but having been forced at the age of twenty-five to leave his native city owing to some political revolution, he wandered to various cities of Greece, and ultimately to Zancle and Catana, Ionian colonies in Sicily, and thence to Elea or Velia, a Greek city on the coast of Italy. This city had, like Miletus, reached a high pitch of commercial prosperity, and like it also became a centre of philosophic teaching. For there Xenophanes remained and founded a school, so that he and his successors received the name of Eleatics. His date is uncertain, but he seems to have been contemporary with Anaximander and Pythagoras, and to have had some knowledge of the doctrine of both. He wrote in various poetic measures, using against the poets, and especially against Homer and Hesiod, their own weapons, to denounce their anthropomorphic theology. If oxen or lions had hands, he said, they would have fashioned gods after their likeness which would have been as authentic as Homer's. As against these poets, and the popular mythology, he insisted that God must be one, eternal, incorporeal, without beginning or ending. As Aristotle strikingly expresses it, he looked forth over the whole heavens and said that God is one, that that which is one is God. The favourite antitheses of his time, the definite and the indefinite, movable and immovable, change producing and by change produced, these and such as these, he maintained, were inapplicable to the eternally and essentially existent. In this there was no partition of organs or faculties, no variation or shadow of turning. The eternal being was like a sphere, everywhere equal, everywhere self-identical. His proof of this was a logical one. The absolutely self-existent could not be thought in conjunction with attributes which either admitted any external influencing him, or any external influenced by him. The prevailing dualism he considered to be, as an ultimate theory of the universe, unthinkable and therefore false. Outside the self-existent there could be no second self-existent, otherwise each would be conditioned by the existence of the other, and the self-existent would be gone. Anything different from the self-existent must be of the non-existent, that is, must be nothing. One can easily see in these discussions some adumbration of many theological or metaphysical difficulties of later times, as of the origin of evil, of free will in man, of the relation of the created world to its creator. If these problems cannot be said to be solved yet, we need not be surprised that Xenophanes did not solve them. He was content to emphasize that which seemed to him to be necessary and true, that God was God, and not either a partner with or a function of matter. At the same time he recognized a world of phenomena, or as he expressed it, a world of guesswork or opinion, Greek doxa. As to the origin of things within this sphere, he was ready enough to borrow from the speculations of his predecessors. Earth and water are the sources from which we spring, and he imagined a time when there was neither sea nor land, but an all-pervading slow and slime. Nay, many such periods of inundation and emergence had been, hence the seashells on the tops of mountains and the fossils in the rocks. Air and fire also as agencies of change are sometimes referred to by him. Anticipations, in fact, are visible of the fourfold classification of the elements which was formerly made by some of his successors. 2. Parmenides The pupil and successor of Xenophanes was Parmenides, a native of Elia. In a celebrated dialogue of Plato bearing the name of this philosopher, he is described as visiting Socrates when the latter was very young. He was then already advanced in years, very hoary, yet noble to look upon, in years some sixty and five. Socrates was born about 479 BC. The birth of Parmenides might, therefore, if this indication be authentic, be about 520. He was of a wealthy and noble family, and able, therefore, to devote himself to a learned leisure. Like his master, he expounded his views in verse, and fragments of his poem of considerable length and importance have been preserved. The title of the work was Perifueros, of nature. The exordium of the poem is one of some grandeur. The poet describes himself as soaring aloft to the sanctuary of wisdom, where it is set in highest ether, the daughters of the sun being his guides, under whose leading, having traversed the path of perpetual day, and at length attained the temple of the goddess, he from her lips received instruction in the eternal verities, and had shown to him the deceptive guesses of mortals. "'Tis for thee,' she says, "'to hear of both, 
to have disclosed to thee on the one hand the sure heart of convincing verity on the other hand the guesses of mortals wherein is no ascertainment nevertheless thou shalt learn of these also that having gone through them all thou mayst see by what unsureness of path must he go who goeth the way of opinion from such a way of searching restrain thou thy thought and let not the much experimenting habit force thee along the path wherein thou must use thine eye yet being sightless and the ear with its clamorous buzzings and the chattering tongue tis by reason that thou must in lengthened trial judge what i shall say to thee thus like xenophanes parmenides draws a deep division between the world of reason and the world of sensation between probative argument and the guesswork of sense impressions the former is the world of being the world of that which truly is self-existent uncreated unending unmoved unchanging ever self-poised and self-sufficient like a sphere knowledge is of this and of this only and as such knowledge is identical with its object for outside this known reality there is nothing in other words knowledge can only be of that which is and that which is alone can know all things which mortals have imagined to be realities are but words as of the birth and death of things of things which were and have ceased to be of here and there of now and then it is obvious enough that in all this and in much more to the same effect reiterated throughout the poem we have no more than a statement in various forms of negation of the inconceivability by human reason of that passage from being as such to that world of phenomena which is now but was not before and will cease to be from being to becoming from eternity to time from the infinite to the finite or as parmenides preferred to call it from the perfect to the imperfect the definite to the indefinite in all this parmenides was not contradicting such observed facts as generation or motion or life or death he was talking of a world which has nothing to do with observation he was endeavouring to grasp what was assumed or necessarily implied as a prior condition of observation or of a world to observe what he and his school seemed to have felt was that there was a danger in all this talk of water or air or other material symbol or even of the indefinite or characterless as the original of all the danger namely that one should lose sight of the idea of law of rationality of eternal self-centred force and so be carried away by some vision of a gradual process of evolution from mere emptiness to fullness of being such a position would not be dissimilar to that of many would-be metaphysicians among evolutionists who not content with the doctrine of evolution as a theory in science an ordered and organizing view of observed facts will try to elevate it into a vision of what is and alone is behind the observed facts they fail to see that the more blind the more accidental so to speak the process of differentiation may be the more it is shown that the struggle for existence drives the wheels of progress along the lines of least resistance by the most commonplace of mechanical necessities in the same proportion must a law be posited behind all this process a reason in nature which gathers up the beginning and the ending the protoplasmic cell which the imagination of evolutionists places at the beginning of time as the starting point of this mighty process is not merely this or that has not merely this or that quality or possibility it is and in the power of that little word is enclosed a whole world of thought which is there at the first remains there all through the evolutions of the protoplasm will be there when these are done is in fact independent of time and space has nothing to do with such distinctions expresses rather their ultimate unreality so far then as parmenides and his school kept a firm grip on this other world aspect of nature as implied even in the simple word is or be so far they did good service in the process of the world's thought on the other hand he and they were naturally enough disinclined as we all are disinclined to remain in the merely or mainly negative or defensive he would not lose his grip of heaven and eternity but he would fain know the secrets of earth and time as well and hence was fashioned the second part of his poem in which he expounds his theory of the world of opinion or guesswork or observation in this world he found two originative principles at work one pertaining to light and heat the other to darkness and cold from the union of these two principles all observable things in creation come and over this union a god-given power presides whose name is love of these two principles the bright one being analogous to fire the dark one to earth he considered the former to be the male or formative element the latter the female or passive element the former therefore had analogies to being as such the latter to non-being the heavenly existences the sun the moon the stars are of pure fire 
have therefore an eternal and unchangeable being they are on the extremest verge of the universe and corresponding to them at the centre is another fiery sphere which itself unmoved is the cause of all motion and generation in the mixed region between the motive and procreative power sometimes called love is at other times called by parmenides necessity bearer of the keys justice ruler etc but while in so far as there was union in the production of man or any other creature the presiding genius might be symbolized as love on the other hand since this union was a union of opposites light and dark discord or strife also had her say in the union thus the nature and character in every creature was the resultant of two antagonistic forces and depended for its particular excellence or defect on the proportions in which these two elements the light and the dark the fiery and the earthy had been commingled no character in greek antiquity at least in the succession of philosophic teachers held a more honoured position than parmenides he was looked on with almost a superstitious reverence by his fellow countrymen plato speaks of him as his father parmenides whom he revered and honoured more than all the other philosophers together to quote professor jowett in his introduction to plato's dialogue parmenides he was the founder of idealism and also of dialectic or in modern phraseology of metaphysics and of logic of the logical aspect of his teaching we shall see a fuller exemplification in his pupil and successor zeno of his metaphysics by way of summing up what has already been said it may be remarked that its substantial excellence consists in the perfect clearness and precision with which parmenides enunciated as fundamental in any theory of the noble universe the priority of existence itself not in time merely or chiefly but as a condition of having any problem to inquire into he practically admits that he does not see how to bridge over the partition between existence in itself and the changeful temporary existing things which the senses give us notions of but whatever the connection may be if there is a connection he is convinced that nothing would be more absurd than to make the data of sense in any way or degree the measure of the reality of existence or the source from which existence itself comes into being on this serenely impersonal position he took his stand we find little or nothing of the querulous personal note so characteristic of much modern philosophy we never find him asking what is to become of me in all this what is my position with regard to this eternally existing reality of course this is not exclusively a characteristic of parmenides but of the time the idea of personal relation to an eternal rewarder was only vaguely held in historical times in greece the conception of personal immortality was a mere pious opinion a doctrine whispered here and there in secret mystery it was not an influential force on men's motives or actions thought was still occupied with the wider universe the heavens and their starry wonders and the strange phenomena of law in nature in the succession of the seasons the rising and setting the fixities and aberrations of the heavenly bodies in the mysteries of coming into being and passing out of it in these and other similar marvels and in the thoughts which they evoked a whole and ample world seemed open for inquiry men and their fate were interesting enough to men but as yet the egotism of man had not attempted to isolate his destiny from the general problem of nature to the crux of philosophy as it appeared to parmenides in the relation of being as such to things which seem to be modernism has appended a sort of corollary in the relation of being as such to my being till the second question was raised its answer of course could not be attempted but all those who in modern times have said with tennyson thou wilt not leave us in the dust thou madest man he knows not why he thinks he was not made to die and thou hast made him thou art just may recognize in parmenides a pioneer for them without knowing it he was fighting the battle of personality in man as well as that of reality in nature End of section four Section 5 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Eleatics. Concluded. 3. Zeno. The third head of the Eleatic school was Zeno. He is described by Plato in the Parmenides as accompanying his master to Athens on the visit already referred to, and as being then nearly forty years of age of a noble figure and fair aspect in personal character he was a worthy pupil of his master being like him a devoted patriot he is even said to have fallen a victim to his patriotism 
and to have suffered bravely the extremest tortures at the hands of a tyrant niacus rather than betray his country his philosophic position was a very simple one he had nothing to add to or vary in the doctrine of parmenides his function was primarily that of an expositor and defender of that doctrine and his particular preeminence consists in the ingenuity of his dialectic resources of defence he is in fact pronounced by aristotle to have been the inventor of dialectic or systematic logic the relation of the two is humorously expressed thus by plato Jowett, plato volume four page one twenty eight i see parmenides said socrates that zeno is your second self in his writings too he puts what you say in another way and would fain deceive us into believing that he is telling us what is new for you in your poems say all is one and of this you adduce excellent proofs and he on the other hand says there is no many and on behalf of this he offers overwhelming evidence to this zeno replies admitting the fact and adds these writings of mine were meant to protect the arguments of parmenides against those who scoff at him and show the many ridiculous and contradictory results which they suppose to follow from the affirmation of the one my answer is an address to the partisans of the many whose attack i return with interest by retorting upon them that their hypothesis of the being of many if carried out appears in a still more ridiculous light than the hypothesis of the being of one the arguments of zeno may therefore be regarded as strictly arguments in kind quibbles if you please but in answer to quibbles the secret of his method was what aristotle calls dichotomy that is he put side by side two contradictory propositions with respect to any particular supposed real thing in experience and then proceeded to show that both these contradictories alike imply what is inconceivable thus a thing must consist either of a finite number of parts or an infinite number assume the number of parts to be finite between them there must either be something or nothing if there is something between them then the whole consists of more parts than it consists of if there is nothing between them then they are not separated therefore they are not parts therefore the whole has no parts at all therefore it is nothing if on the other hand the number of parts is infinite then the same kind of argument being applied the magnitude of the whole is by infinite successive positing of intervening parts shown to be infinite therefore this one thing being infinitely large is everything take again any supposed fact as that an arrow moves an arrow cannot move except in space it cannot move in space without being in space at any moment of its supposed motion it must be in a particular space being in that space it must at the time during which it is in it be at rest but the total time of its supposed motion is made up of the moments composing that time and to each of these moments the same argument applies therefore either the arrow never was anywhere or it always was at rest or again take objects moving at unequal rates as achilles and a tortoise let the tortoise have a start of any given length then achilles however much he excel in speed will never overtake the tortoise for while achilles has passed over the originally intervening space the tortoise will have passed over a certain space and when achilles has passed over this second space the tortoise will have again passed over some space and so on ad infinitum therefore in an infinite time there must always be a space though infinitely diminishing between the tortoise and achilles that is the tortoise must always be at least a little in front these will be sufficient to show the kind of arguments employed by zeno in themselves they are of no utility and zeno never pretended that they had any but as against those who denied that existence as such was a datum independent of experience something different from a mere sum of isolated things his arguments were not only effective but substantial the whole modern sensational or experiential school who derive our abstract ideas as they are called from phenomena or sensation manifest the same impatience of any analysis of what they mean by phenomena or sensation as no doubt zeno's opponents manifested of his analyses as in criticizing the one modern critics are ready with their answer that zeno's quibbles are simply a play of words on the well-known properties of infinities so they are quick to tell us that sensation is an affection of the sentient organism ignoring in the first case the prior question where the idea of infinity came from and in the second where the idea of a sentient organism came from indirectly as we shall see zeno had a great effect on subsequent philosophies by the development of a process of ingenious verbal distinction which in the hands of so-called sophists and others became a weapon of considerable if temporary power 4. Melissus. 
the fourth and last of the eleatic philosophers was melissus a native of samos his date may be fixed as about 440 bc he took an active part in the politics of his native country and on one occasion was commander of the samian fleet in a victorious engagement with the athenians when samos was being besieged by pericles he belongs to the eleatic school in respect of doctrine and method but we have no evidence of his ever having resided at elea nor any reference to his connection with the philosophers there except the statement that he was a pupil of parmenides he developed very fully what is technically called in the science of logic the dilemma thus for example he begins his treatise on existence or on nature thus if nothing exists then there is nothing for us to talk about but if there is such a thing as existence it must either come into being or be ever existing if it come into being it must come from the existing or the non-existing now that anything which exists above all that which is absolutely existent should come from what is not is impossible nor can it come from that which is for then it would be already and would not come into being that which exists therefore comes not into being it must therefore be ever existing by similar treatment of other conceivable alternatives he proceeds to show that as the existent had no beginning so it can have no ending in time from this by a curious transition which aristotle quotes as an example of loose reasoning he concludes that the existent can have no limit in space either as being thus unlimited it must be one therefore immovable there being nothing else into which it can move or change and therefore always self-identical in extent and character it cannot therefore have any body for body has parts and is not therefore one being incapable of change one might perhaps conclude that the absolutely existing being is incapable of any mental activity or consciousness we have no authority for assuming that melissus came to this conclusion but there is a curious remark of aristotle's respecting this and previous philosophers of the school which certain critics have made to bear some such interpretation he says parmenides seems to hold by a unity in thought melissus by a material unity hence the first defines the one as limited the second declared it to be unlimited xenophanes made no clear statement on this question he simply gazing up to the arch of heaven declared the one is god but the difference between melissus and his master can hardly be said to be a difference of doctrine point for point they are identical the difference is a difference of vision or mental picture as to this mighty all which is one melissus so to speak places himself at the centre of this universal being and sees it stretching out infinitely unendingly in space and in time its oneness comes to him as the sum of these infinities parmenides on the other hand sees all these endless immensities as related to a centre he so to speak enfolds them all in the grasp of his unifying thought and as thus equally and necessarily related to a central unity he pronounces the all a sphere and therefore limited the two doctrines antithetical in terms are identical in fact the absolutely unlimited and the absolutely self-limited are only two ways of saying the same thing this difference of view or vision aristotle in the passage quoted expresses as a difference between thought greek logos and matter greek hule this is just a form of his own radical distinction between essence and difference form and matter of which much will be said later on it is like the difference between deduction and induction in the first you start from the universal and see within it the particulars in the second you start from the particulars and gather them into completeness and reality in a universal the substance remains the same only the point of view is different to put the matter in modern mathematical form one might say the universe is to be conceived as a sphere parmenides of infinite radius melissus aristotle is not blaming melissus or praising parmenides as for xenophanes aristotle after his manner finds in him the potentiality of both his prior both to the process of thought from universal to particular and to that from particular to universal he does not argue at all his function is intuition he looks out on the mighty sky and says the one is god Melissus applied the results of his analysis in an interesting way to the question already raised by his predecessors of the trustworthiness of sensation. His argument is as follows. If there were many real existences, to each of them the same reasonings must apply as I have already used with reference to the one existence. That is to say, if earth really exists, and water and air and iron and gold and fire and things living and things dead, and black and white, and all the various things whose reality men ordinarily assume, 
if all these really exist and our sight and our hearing give us facts then each of these as really existing must be what we concluded the one existence must be among other things each must be unchangeable and can never become other than it really is but assuming that sight and hearing and apprehension are true we find the cold becoming hot and the hot becoming cold the hard changes to soft the soft to hard the living thing dies and from that which is not living a living thing comes into being in short everything changes and what now is in no way resembles what was it follows therefore that we neither see nor apprehend realities in fact we cannot pay the slightest regard to experience without being landed in self-contradictions we assume that there are all sorts of really existing things having a permanence both of form and power and yet we imagine these very things altering and changing according to what we from time to time see about them if they were realities as we first perceived them our sight must now be wrong for if they were real they could not change nothing can be stronger than reality whereas to suppose it changed we must affirm that the real has ceased to be and that that which was not has displaced it to melissus therefore as to his predecessors the world of sense was a world of illusion the very first principles or assumptions of which as of the truthfulness of the senses and the reality of the various objects which we see are unthinkable and absurd the weakness as well as the strength of the aleatic position consisted in its purely negative and critical attitude the assumptions of ordinary life and experience could not stand for a moment when assailed in detail by their subtle analysis so-called facts were like a world of ghosts which the sword of truth passed through without resistance but somehow the sword might pierce them through and through and show by all manner of arguments their unsubstantiality but there they were still thronging about the philosopher and refusing to be gone the world of sense might be only illusion but there the illusion was you could not lay it or exorcise it by calling it illusion or opinion what was this opinion what was the nature of its subject matter how did it operate and if its results were not true or real what was their nature these were questions which still remained when the analysis of the idea of absolute existence had been pushed to its completion these were the questions which the next school of philosophy attempted to answer after the idealists the realists after the philosophy of mind the philosophy of matter end of section five section six of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the atomists one anaxagoras anaxagoras was born at clasomenae a city of iona about the year five hundred b c at the age of twenty he removed to athens of which city clasomene was for some time a dependency this step on his part may have been connected with the circumstances attending the great invasion of greece by xerxes in the year 480 for xerxes drew a large contingent of his army from the ionian cities which he had subdued and many who were unwilling to serve against their mother country may have taken refuge about that time in athens at athens he resided for nearly fifty years and during that period became the friend and teacher of many eminent men among the rest of pericles the great athenian statesman and of euripides the dramatist like most of the ionian philosophers he had a taste for mathematics and astronomy as well as for certain practical applications of mathematics among other books he is said to have written a treatise on the art of scene designing for the stage possibly to oblige his friend and pupil euripides in his case as in that of his predecessors only fragments of his philosophic writings have been preserved and the connection of certain portions of his teaching as they have come down to us remains somewhat uncertain with respect to the constitution of the universe we have the following origination and destruction are phrases which are generally misunderstood among the greeks nothing really is originated or destroyed the only processes which actually take place are combination and separation of elements already existing these elements we are to conceive as having been in a state of chaos at first infinite in number and infinitely small forming in their immobility a confused and characterless unity about this chaos was spread the air and ether infinite also in the multitude of their particles and infinitely extended before separation commenced there was no clear color or appearance in anything whether of moist or dry of hot or cold of bright or dark but only an infinite number of the seeds of things having concealed in them all manner of forms and colors and savors there is a curious resemblance in this to the opening verses of genesis the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep 
nor is the next step in his philosophy without its resemblance to that in the biblical record as summarized by diogenes laertius it takes this form all things were as one then cometh mind and by division brought all things into order conceiving as aristotle puts it that the original elements of things had no power to generate or develop out of themselves things as they exist philosophers were forced by the facts themselves to seek the immediate cause of this development they were unable to believe that fire or earth or any such principle was adequate to account for the order and beauty visible in the frame of things nor did they think it possible to attribute these to mere innate necessity or chance one anaxagoras observing how in living creatures mind is the ordering force declared that in nature also this must be the cause of order and beauty and in so declaring he seemed when compared with those before him as one sober amidst a crowd of babblers elsewhere however aristotle modifies this commendation anaxagoras he says uses mind only as a kind of last resort dragging it in when he fails otherwise to account for a phenomenon but never thinking of it else and in the phaedo plato makes socrates speak of the high hopes with which he had taken to the works of anaxagoras and how grievously he had been disappointed as i proceeded he says i found my philosopher altogether forsaking mind or any other principle of order and having recourse to air and ether and water and other eccentricities anaxagoras then at least on this side of his teaching must be considered rather as the author of a phrase than as the founder of a philosophy the phrase remained and had a profound influence on subsequent philosophies but in his own hands it was little more than a dead letter his immediate interest was rather in the variety of phenomena than in their conceived principle of unity he is theoretically perhaps on the side of the angels in practice he is a materialist mind he conceived as something apart sitting throned like zeus upon the heights giving doubtless the first impulse to the movement of things but leaving them for the rest to their own inherent tendencies as distinguished from them it was he conceived the one thing which was absolutely pure and unmixed all things else had intermixture with every other the mixtures increasing in complexity towards the centre of things on the outmost verge were distributed the finest and least complex forms of things the sun the moon the stars the more dense gathering together to form as it were in the centre of the vortex the earth and its manifold existences by the intermixture of air and earth and water containing in themselves the infinitely varied seeds of things plants and animals were developed the seeds themselves are too minute to be apprehended by the senses but we can divine their character by the various characters of the visible things themselves each of these having a necessary correspondence with the nature of the seeds from which they respectively were formed thus for a true apprehension of things sensation and reason are both necessary sensation to certify to the apparent characters of objects reason to pass from these to the nature of the invisible seeds or atoms which cause those characters taken by themselves our sensations are false inasmuch as they give us only combined impressions yet they are a necessary stage towards the truth as providing the materials which reason must separate into their real elements from this brief summary we may gather that mind was conceived so to speak as placed at the beginning of existence inasmuch as it is the first originator of the vortex motions of the atoms or seeds of things it was conceived also at the end of existence as the power which by analysis of the data of sensation goes back through the complexity of actual being to the original unmingled or undeveloped nature of things but the whole process of nature itself between these limits anaxagoras conceived as a purely mechanical or at least physical development the uncertainty of his view as between these two alternative ways of considering it being typified in his use of the two expressions atoms and seeds the analogies of this view with those of modern materialism which finds in the ultimate molecules of matter the promise and the potency of all life and all existence need not be here enlarged upon after nearly half a century's teaching at athens anaxagoras was indicted on a charge of inculcating doctrines subversive of religion it is obvious enough that his theories left no room for the popular mythology but the athenians were not usually very sensitive as to the bearing of mere theories upon their public institutions it seems probable that the accusation was merely a cloak for political hostility anaxagoras was the friend and intimate of pericles leader of the democratic party in the state and the attack upon anaxagoras was really a political move intended to damage pericles as such pericles himself accepted it and the trial became a contest of strength which resulted in a partial success and a partial defeat for both sides pericles succeeded in saving his friend's life 
but the opposite party obtained a sentence of fine and banishment against him anaxagoras retired to lampsacus a city on the hellespont and there after some five years he died end of section six section seven of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the atomists continued two empedocles empedocles was a native of agrigentum a greek colony in sicily at the time when he flourished in his native city circa 440 bc it was one of the wealthiest and most powerful communities in that wealthy and powerful island it had however been infested like its neighbors by the designs of tyrants and the dissensions of rival factions empedocles was a man of high family and he exercised the influence which his position and his abilities secured him in promoting and maintaining the liberty of his fellow countrymen partly on this account partly from a reputation which with or without his own will he acquired for an almost miraculous skill in healing and necromantic arts empedocles attained to a position of singular personal power over his contemporaries and was indeed regarded as semi-divine his death was hedged about with mystery according to one story he gave a great feast to his friends and offered a sacrifice then when his friends went to rest he disappeared and was no more seen according to a story less dignified and better known deus immortalis haberi lum cupit empedocles ardentem frigidus aetnam in siluit horace ad pisones four sixty four and following eager to be deemed a god empedocles coldly threw himself in burning etna the fraud it was said was detected by one of his shoes being cast up from the crater whatever the manner of his end the etna story may probably be taken as an ill-natured joke of some sceptic wit and it is certain that no such story was believed by his fellow-citizens who rendered in after years divine honours to his name like xenophanes parmenides and other greco-italian philosophers he expounded his views in verse but he reached a poetic excellence unattained by any predecessor aristotle characterizes his gift as homeric and himself as a master of style employing freely metaphors and other poetic forms lucretius also speaks of him in terms of high admiration de naturum rerum one seven hundred and sixteen and following foremost among them is empedocles of agrigentum child of the island with the triple capes a land wondrous deemed in many wise and worthy to be viewed of all men rich it is in all manner of good things and strong in the might of its men yet naught within its borders men deem more divine or more wondrous or more dear than her illustrious son nay the songs which issued from his godlike breast are eloquent yet and expound his findings wondrous well so that hardly is he thought to have been of mortal clay like the eleatics he denies that the senses are an absolute test of truth for straitened are the powers that have been shed upon our frames and many the frets that cross us and defeat our care and short the span of unsatisfying existence wherein it is given us to see short-lived as a wreath of smoke men rise and fleet away persuaded but of that alone which each has chanced to light upon driven hither and thither and vainly do they pray to find the whole for this men may not see or hear or grasp with the hand of thought yet that there is a kind or degree of knowledge possible for man his next words suggest when he continues thou therefore since hither thou hast been born hear and thou shalt learn so much as tis given to mortal thoughts to reach then follows an invocation in true epic style to the much wooed white-armed virgin muse wherein he prays that folly and impurity may be far from the lips of him the teacher and that sending forth her swift reined chariot from the shrine of piety the muse may grant him to hear so much as is given to mortal hearing there follows a warning uttered by the muse to her would-be disciple thee the flowers of mortal distinctions shall not seduce to utter in daring of heart more than thou mayest that thereby thou mightest soar to the highest heights of wisdom and now behold and see availing thyself of every device whereby the truth may in each matter be revealed trusting not more to sight for thy learning than to hearing nor to hearing with its loud echoings more than to the revelations of the tongue nor to any one of the many ways whereby there is a path to knowledge keep a check on the revelation of the hands also and apprehend each matter in the way whereby it is made plain to thee the correction of the one sense by the others and of all by reason 
this empedocles deemed the surest road to knowledge he thus endeavoured to hold a middle place between the purely abstract reasoning of the Eleatic philosophy and the unreasoned first guesses of ordinary observations suggested by this or that sense and chiefly by the eyes the senses might supply the raw materials of knowledge unordered unrelated nay even chaotic and mutually destructive but in their contradictions of each other he hoped to find a starting point for order amidst the seeming chaos reason should weigh reason should reject but reason also should find a residuum of truth in our next fragment we have his enunciation in symbolical language of the four elements by him first formulated here first of all what are the root principles of all things being four in number zeus the bright shiner that is fire and hera air and life-bearing idoneus earth and nestus water who with her teardrops waters the fountain of mortality here also this other that i will tell thee nothing of all that perisheth ever is created nothing ever really findeth an end in death there is naught but a mingling and a parting again of that which was mingled and this is what men call a coming into being foolish they for in them is no far-reaching thought that they should dream that what was not before can be or that aught which is can utterly perish and die thus again empedocles shows himself an eclectic in denying that aught can come into being he holds with the eleatics in identifying all seeming creation and ceasing to be with certain mixtures and separations of matter eternally existing he links himself rather to the doctrine of anaxagoras these four elements constitute the total corpus of the universe eternal as a whole unmoved and immovable perfect like a sphere but within this sphere like self-centered all there are eternally proceeding separations and new unions of the elements of things and every one of these is at once a birth and an infinity of dyings a dying and an infinity of births towards this perpetual life in death and death in life two forces work inherent in the universe one of these he names love friendship harmony aphrodite goddess of love passion joy the other he calls hate discord ares god of war envy strife neither of the one nor of the other may man have apprehension by the senses they are spiritually discerned yet of the first men have some adumbration in the creative force within their own members which they name by the names of love and nuptial joy somewhat prosaically summing up the teaching of empedocles aristotle says that he thus posited six first principles in nature four material two motive or efficient and he goes on to remark that in the working out of his theory of nature empedocles though using his originative principles more consistently than anaxagoras used his principle of no sore thought not infrequently nevertheless resorts to some natural force in the elements themselves or even to chance or necessity nor he continues as he clearly marked off the functions of his two efficient forces nay he has so confounded them that at times it is discord that through separation leads to new unions and love that through union causes diremption of that which was before at times too empedocles seems to have had a vision of these two forces not as the counteracting yet cooperative pulsations so to speak of the universal life but as rival forces having had in time their periods of alternate supremacy and defeat while all things were in union under the influence of love then was there neither earth nor water nor air nor fire much less any of the individual things that in eternal interchange are formed of them but all was in perfect sphere-like balance enwrapped in the serenity of an eternal silence then came the reign of discord whereby war arose in heaven as of the fabled giants and endless change endless birth and endless death these inconsistencies of doctrine which aristotle notes as faults in empedocles are perhaps rather proofs of the philosophic value of his conceptions just as hegel in modern philosophy could only adequately formulate his conceptions through logical contradictions so also perhaps under the veil of antagonisms of utterance empedocles sought to give a fuller vision discord in his own doctrine not less than in his conception of nature being thus the co-worker with love the ordinary mind for the ordinary purposes of science seeks exactness of distinction in things and language being the creation of ordinary experience lends itself to such a purpose the philosophic mind finding ready to its hand no forms of expression adapted to its conceptions which have for their final end union and not distinction can only attain its purpose by variety or even contradictoriness of representation thus to ordinary conception cause must precede effect 
to the philosophic mind dealing as it does with the idea of an organic whole everything is at once cause and effect is at once therefore prior to and subsequent to every other is at once the ruling and the ruled the conditioning and that which is conditioned so to empedocles there are four elements yet in the eternal perfection the silent reign of love there are none of them there are two forces working upon these and against each other yet each is like the other a unifying or a separating force as one pleases to regard them and in the eternal silence the ideal perfectness there is no warfare at all there is joy in love which creates and in creating destroys there is joy in the eternal stillness nay this is itself the ultimate joy there are two forces working love and hate yet is there but one force and that force is necessity and for final contradiction the universe is self-balanced self-conditioned a perfect sphere therefore this necessity is perfect self-realization and consequently perfect freedom the men who have had the profoundest vision of things heraclitus empedocles socrates plato i and aristotle himself when he was the thinker and not the critic not to speak of the great moderns whether preachers or philosophers have none of them been greatly concerned for consistency of expression for a mere logical self-identity of doctrine Life in every form, nay existence in any form, is a union of contradictories, a complex of antagonisms. And the highest and deepest minds are those that are most adequate to have the vision of these antagonisms in their contrariety, and also in their unity. To see and hear as Empedocles did the eternal war and clamour, but to discern also, as he did in it, and through it, and behind it, and about it, the eternal peace and the eternal silence. Philosophy, in fact, is a form of poesy it is if one pleases so to call it fiction founded upon fact it is not for that reason the less noble a form of human thought rather it is the more noble in the same way as poetry is nobler than mere narrative and art than representation and imagination than perception philosophy is indeed one of the noblest forms of poetry because the facts which are its basis are the profoundest the most eternally interesting the most universally significant and not only has it nobility in respect of the greatness of its subject matter it has also possibilities of an essential truth deeper and more far-reaching and more fruitful than any demonstrative system of facts can have a great poem or work of art of any kind is an adumbration of truths which transcend any actual fact and as such it brings us nearer to the underlying fundamentals of reality which all actual occurrences only by accumulation tend to realize philosophy then in so far as it is great is like other great art prophetic in both interpretations of the word both as expounding the inner truth that is anterior to actuality and also as anticipating that final realization of all things for which the whole creation groaneth it is thus at the basis of religion of art of morals it is the accumulated sense of the highest in man with respect to what is greatest and most mysterious in and about him the facts indeed with which philosophy attempts to deal are so vital and so vast that even the greatest intellects may well stagger occasionally under the burden of their own conceptions of them to rise to the height of such an argument demands a more than miltonic imagination and criticisms directed only at this or that fragment of the whole are as irrelevant if not as inept as the criticism of the mathematician directed against paradise lost that it proved nothing the mystery of being and of life the true purport and reality of this world of which we seem to be a part and yet of which we seem to have some apprehension as though we were other than a part the strange problems of creation and change and birth and death of love and sin and purification of a heaven dreamt of or believed in or somehow actually apprehended of life here and of an immortality yearned after and hoped for these problems these mysteries no philosophy ever did or ever can empty of their strangeness or bring down to the level of the commonplace certainties of daily life or of science which are no more than shadows after all that seem certainties because of the background of mystery on which they are cast but just as an individual is a higher being a fuller more truly human creature when he has got so far removed from the merely animal existence as to realize that there are such problems and mysteries so also the humanization of the race the development of its noblest peoples and its noblest literatures have been conditioned by the successive visions of these mysteries in more and more complex organization by the great philosophers and poets and preachers the systems of such men may die but such deaths mean as empedocles said of the ordinary deaths of things only an infinity of new births 
being dead their systems yet speak in the inherited language and ideas and aspirations and beliefs that form the never-ending still renewing material for new philosophies and new faiths in thales heraclitus pythagoras parmenides empedocles we have been touching hands with an apostolic succession of great men and great thinkers and great poets men of noble life and lofty thoughts true prophets and revealers and the apostolic succession even within the greek world does not fail for centuries yet passing from the general conceptions of empedocles to those more particular rationalizations of particular problems which very largely provided the motive of early philosophies while scientific methods were in an undeveloped and uncritical condition we may notice such interesting statements as the following the earth which is at the center of the sphere of the universe remains firm because the spin of the universe as a whole keeps it in its place like the water in a spinning cup he has the same conception of the early condition of the earth as in other cosmogonies at first it was a chaos of watery slow which slowly under the influence of sky and sun parted off into earth and sea the sea was the sweat of the earth and by analogy with the sweat it was salt the heavens on the other hand were formed of air and fire and the sun was as it were a speculum at which the effulgence and the heat of the whole heavens concentrated but that the ether and the fire had not been fully separated from earth and water he held to be proved by the hot fountains and fiery phenomena which must have been so familiar to a native of sicily curiously enough he imagined fire to possess a solidifying power and therefore attributed to it the solidity of the earth and the hardness of the rocks no doubt he had observed some effects of fire in metamorphic formations in his own vicinity he had also a conception of the gradual development on the earth of higher and higher forms of life the first being rude and imperfect and a struggle for existence ensuing in which the monstrous and the deficient gradually were eliminated the two-faced the double-breasted the oxen shaped with human prows or human shaped with the head of ox or hermaphrodite and so forth love and strife worked out their ends upon these varied forms some procreated and reproduced after their image others were incapable of reproduction from mere monstrosity or weakness and disappeared something other than mere chance thus governed the development of things there was a law a reason a logos governing the process this law or reason he perhaps fancifully illustrated by attributing the different characters of flesh and sinew and bone to the different numerical proportions in which they severally contain the different elements on this aristotle keen-scented critic as he was has a question or series of questions to ask as to the relation between this logos or principle of orderly combination and love as the ruling force in all unions of things is love he asks a cause of mixtures of any sort or only of such sorts as logos dictates and whether then is love identical with this logos or are they separate and distinct and if so what settles their separate functions questions which empedocles did not answer and perhaps would not have tried to answer had he heard them the soul or life principle in man empedocles regarded as an ordered composite of all the elements or principles of the life in nature and in this kinship of the elements in man and the elements in nature he found a rationale of our powers of perception by the earth said he we have perception of earth by water we have perception of water of the divine ether by ether of destructive fire by fire of love by love of strife by strife he therefore as aristotle observes drew no radical distinction between sense apprehension and thought he located the faculty of apprehension more specifically in the blood conceiving that in it the combination of the elements was most complete and the variety of apprehensive gift in different persons he attributed to the greater or lesser perfectness of this blood mixture in them individually those that were dull and stupid had a relative deficiency of the lighter and more invisible elements those that were quick and impulsive had a relatively larger proportion of these again specific faculties depended on local perfection of mixture in certain organs orators having this perfectness in their tongues cunning craftsmen possessing it in their hands and so on and the degrees of capacity of sensation which he found in various animals or even plants he explained in similar fashion the process of sensation he conceived to be conditioned by an actual emission from the bodies perceived of elements or images of themselves which found access to our apprehension through channels congruous to their nature but ordering criticizing organizing these various apprehensions was the mind or nous which he conceived to be of a divine nature 
to be indeed an expression or emanation of the divine and here has been preserved a strangely interesting passage in which he incorporates and develops in characteristic fashion the doctrine of transmigration of souls there is a decree of necessity a law given of old from the gods eternal sealed with mighty oaths that when any heavenly creature daemon of those that are endowed with length of days shall in waywardness of heart defile his hands with sin of deed or speech he shall wander for thrice ten thousand seasons far from the dwellings of the blessed taking upon him in length of time all manner of mortal forms traversing in turn the many toilsome paths of existence him the ethereal wrath hurries onward to the deep and the deep spews him forth on to the threshold of earth and unworn earth casts him up to the fires of the sun and again the ether hurls him into the eddies one receives him and then another but detested is he of them all of such am i also one an exile and a wanderer from god a slave to strife and its madness thus to his mighty conception the life of all creation and not of man only was a great expiation an eternal round of punishment for sin and in the unending flux of life each creature rose or fell in the scale of existence according to the deeds of good or ill done in each successive life rising sometimes to the state of men or among men to the high functions of physicians and prophets and kings or among beasts to the dignity of the lion or among trees to the beauty of the laurel or on the contrary sinking through sin to lowest forms of bestial or vegetable life till at the last they who through obedience and right doing have expiated their wrongs are endowed by the blessed gods with endless honour to dwell forever with them and share their banquets untouched any more with human care and sorrow and pain the slaying of any living creature therefore empedocles like pythagoras abhorred for all were kin all foul acts were forms of worse than suicide life should be a long act of worship of expiation of purification and in the dim past he pictured a vision of a golden age in which men worshipped not many gods but love only and not with sacrifices of blood but with pious images and cunningly odorous incense and offerings of fragrant myrrh with abstinence also and above all with that noblest abstinence the abstinence from vice and wrong End of section seven. Section eight of a short history of Greek philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight. The atomists concluded. Three. Leucippus and Democritus. Leucippus is variously called a native of Elia, of Abdera, of Melos, of Meletus. He was a pupil of Zeno the Aleatic. Democritus was a native of Abdera. They seem to have been almost contemporary with Socrates. The two are associated as thoroughgoing teachers of the atomic philosophy, but Democritus, the laughing philosopher, as he was popularly called in later times, in distinction from Heraclitus, the weeping philosopher, was much the more famous. He lived to a great age. He himself refers to his travels and studies thus. Above all the men of my time I travelled farthest, and extended my inquiries to places the most distant. I visited the most varied climates and countries, heard the largest number of learned men, nor has any one surpassed me in the gathering together of writings and their interpretation no not even the most learned of the egyptians with whom i spent five years we are also informed that through desire of learning he visited babylon and chaldea to visit the astrologers and the priests democritus was not less prolific as a writer than he was voracious as a student and in him first the division of philosophy into certain great sections such as physical mathematical ethical was clearly drawn we are however mainly concerned with his teaching in its more strictly philosophical aspects his main doctrine was professedly antithetical to that of the Eleatics, who it will be remembered worked out on abstract lines the theory of one indivisible eternal immovable being democritus on the contrary declared for two co-equal elements the full and the empty or being and non-entity the latter he maintained was as real as the former as we should put it body is unthinkable except by reference to space which that body does not occupy as well as to space which it does occupy and conversely space is unthinkable except by reference to body actually or potentially filling or defining it what democritus hoped to get by this double or correlative system was a means of accounting for or conceiving of change in nature the difficulty with the Eleatics was as we have seen how to understand whence or why the transition from that which absolutely is to this strange at least apparent system of eternal flux and transformation 
democritus hoped to get over this difficulty by starting as fully with that which is not in other words with that which wants change in order to have any recognizable being at all as with that which is and which therefore might be conceived as seeking and requiring only to be what it is having got his principle of stability and his principle of change on an equal footing democritus next laid it down that all the differences visible in things were differences either of shape of arrangement or of position practically that is he considered that what seemed to us to be qualitative differences in things for example hot or cold sweet or sour green or yellow are only resulting impressions from different shapes or different arrangements or different modes of presentation among the atoms of which things are composed coming now to that which is democritus as against the eleatics maintained that this was not a unity some one immovable unchangeable existence but an innumerable number of atoms invisible by reason of their smallness which career through empty space that which is not and by their union bring objects into being by their separation bring these to destruction the action of these atoms on each other depended on the manner in which they were brought into contact but in any case the unity of any object was only an apparent unity it being really constituted of a multitude of interlaced and mutually related particles and all growth or increase of the object being conditioned by the introduction into the structure of additional atoms from without for the motions of the atoms he had no anterior cause to offer other than necessity or fate they existed and necessarily and always had existed in a state of whirl and for that which always had been he maintained that no preceding cause could legitimately or reasonably be demanded nothing then could come out of nothing all the visible structure of the universe had its origin in the movements of the atoms that constituted it and conditioned its infinite changes the atoms by a useful but perhaps too convenient metaphor he called the seeds of all things they were infinite in number though not infinite in the number of their shapes many atoms were similar to each other and this similarity formed a basis of union among them a warp so to speak or solid foundation across which the woof of dissimilar atoms played to constitute the differences of things out of this idea of an eternal eddy or whirl democritus developed a cosmogony the lighter atoms he imagined flew to the outmost rim of the eddy there constituting the heavenly fires and the heavenly ether the heavier atoms gathered at the centre forming successively air and water and the solid earth not that there was only one such system or world but rather multitudes of them all varying one from the other some without sun or moon others with greater luminaries than those of our system others with a greater number all however had necessarily a centre all as systems were necessarily spherical as regards the atoms he conceived that when they differed in weight this must be in respect of a difference in their essential size in this he was no doubt combating the notion that the atoms say of lead or gold were in their substance taking equal quantities of greater weight than the atoms of water or air the difference of weight in objects depended on the proportion which the atoms in them bore to the amount of empty space which was interlaced with them on the other hand a piece of iron was lighter yet harder than a piece of lead of equal size because of the special way in which the atoms in it were linked together there were fewer atoms in it but they were in consequence of their structure and arrangement more tightly strung in all this democritus was with great resolution working out what we may call a strictly mechanical theory of the universe even the soul or life principle in living creatures was simply a structure of the finest and roundest and therefore most nimble atoms with which he compared the extremely attenuated dust particles visible in their never-ending dance in a beam of light passed into a darkened room this structure of exceeding tenuity and nimbleness was the source of the motion characteristic of living creatures and provided that elastic counteracting force to the inward pressing nimble air whereby were produced the phenomena of respiration every object in fact whether living or not kept its form and distinctive existence by its possession in degree of a kind of soul or spirit of resistance in its structure adequate to counteract the pressure of external forces upon its particles sensation and perception were forms in which these external forces acted upon the more nimble and lively existences more particularly on living creatures for every body was continually sending forth emanations or images resembling itself sufficiently in form and structure to affect perceptive bodies with an apprehension of that form and structure these images traveled by a process of successive transmission similar to that by which wave motions are propagated in water they were in other words not movements of the particles of the objects which latter must otherwise in time grow less and fade away but a modification in the arrangement of the particles immediately next the object 
which modification reproduced itself in the next following, and so on right through the medium to the perceptive body. These images tended by extension in all directions to reach vast dimensions at times, and to influence the minds of men in sleep and on other occasions in strange ways. Hence men imagined gods, and attributed those mighty phenomena of nature, earthquakes, tempests, lightning and thunder, and dire eclipses of sun and moon, to the vaguely visible powers which they imagined they saw. There was indeed a soul or spirit of the universe, as there was a soul or spirit of every individual thing that constituted it. But this was only a finer system of atoms, after all. All else is convention or dream. The only realities are atoms and emptiness, matter and space. Of absolute verity through the senses we know nothing. Our perceptions are only conventional interpretations of we know not what. For to other living creatures these same sensations have other meanings than they have to us and even the same person is not always affected alike by the same thing. Which, then, is the true of two different perceptions we cannot say? And therefore either there is no such thing as truth, or at all events we know through the senses nothing of it. The only genuine knowledge is that which transcends appearances, and reasons out what is, irrespective of appearances. In other words, the only genuine knowledge is that of the atomic philosopher, and his knowledge is the result of the happy mixture of his atoms, whereby all is in equal balance, neither too hot nor too cold. Such a man, seeing in the mind's eye the whole universe a tissue of whirling and interlacing atoms, with no real mystery or terror before or after, will live a life of cheerful fearlessness, undisturbed by terrors of a world to come or of powers unseen. His happiness is not in feastings or in gold, but in a mind at peace. And three human perfections he will seek to attain, to reason rightly, to speak graciously, to do his duty. End of section 8. Section 9 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. The Sophists. A certain analogy may perhaps be discerned between the progression of philosophic thought in Greece as we have traced it, and the political development which had its course in almost every Greek state during the same period. The Ionic philosophy may be regarded as corresponding with the kingly era in Greek politics. Philosophy sits upon the heights and utters its authoritative dicta for the resolution of the seeming contradictions of things. One principle is master, but the testimony of the senses is not denied. The harmony of thought and sensation is sought in the interpretation of appearances by the light of a ruling idea. In Pythagoras and his order we have an aristocratic organization of philosophy. Its truths are for the few, the best men are the teachers, equal as initiated partakers in the mysteries, supreme over all outside their society. A reasoned and reasonable order and method are symbolized by their theory of number. Their philosophy is political, their politics oligarchic. In the Aleatic school we have a succession of personal attempts to construct a domination in the theory of nature. Some ideal conception is attempted to be so elevated above the data of sensation as to override them altogether, and the general result we are now to see throughout the philosophic world, as it was seen also through the world of politics, in a total collapse of the principle of forced authority and a development of successively nearer approaches to anarchic individualism and doubt. The notion of an ultimately true and real, whatever form it might assume in various theorists' hands, being in its essence apart from and even antagonistic to the perceptions of sense, was at last definitely cast aside as a delusion. What remained were the individual perceptions, admittedly separate, unreasoned, unrelated. Reason was dethroned, chaos was king. In other words, what seemed to any individual sentient being at any moment to be, that for him was and nothing else was. The distinction between the real and the apparent was definitely attempted to be abolished, not as hitherto by rejecting the sensually apparent in favour of the rationally conceived real, but by the denial of any such real altogether. The individualistic revolution in philosophy not only, however, had analogies with the similar revolution contemporaneously going on in Greek politics, it was greatly facilitated by it. Each, in short, acted and reacted on the other. Just as the sceptical philosophy of the encyclopedists in France promoted the revolution, and the revolution in its turn developed and confirmed the philosophic scepticism, so also the collapse of contending philosophies in Greece promoted the collapse of contending systems of political authority, and the collapse of political authority facilitated the growth of that individualism in thought with which the name of the sophists is associated. Cicero, Brutus twelve, definitely connects the rise of these teachers with the expulsion of the tyrants and the establishment of democratic republics in Sicily. 
From 466 to 406 BC, Syracuse was democratically governed, and a free career to talents, as in revolutionary France, so also in revolutionary Greece, began to be promoted by the elaboration of a system of persuasive argument. Devices of method called commonplaces were constructed whereby, irrespective of the truth or falsehood of the subject matter, a favourable vote in the public assemblies, a successful verdict in the public courts, might more readily be procured. Thus, by skill of verbal rhetoric, the worse might be made to appear the better reason, and philosophy, so far as it continued its functions, became a search not for the real amidst the confusions of the seeming and unreal, but a search for the seeming and the plausible, to the detriment, or at least to the ignoring, of any reality at all. The end of philosophy, then, was no longer universal truth, but individual success, and consistently enough the philosopher himself professed the individualism of his own point of view, by teaching only those who were prepared to pay him for his teaching. All over Greece, with the growth of democracy, this philosophy of persuasion became popular, but it was to Athens, under Pericles at this time the centre of all that was most vivid and splendid in Greek life and thought, that the chief teachers of the new philosophy flocked from every part of the Greek world. The first great leader of the sophists was Protagoras. He, it is said, was the first to teach for pay. He also was the first to adopt the name of sophist. In the word sophist there was indeed latent the idea which subsequently attached to it, but as first used it seems to have implied this only, that skill was the object of the teaching rather than truth. The new teachers professed themselves practical men, not mere theorists. The Greek word, in short, meant an able cultivated man in any branch of the arts, and the development of practical capacity was doubtless what Protagoras intended to indicate as the purpose of his teaching, when he called himself a sophist. But the ability he really undertook to cultivate was ability to persuade, for Greece at this time was nothing if not political, and persuasive oratory was the one road to political success. And as Athens was the great centre of Greek politics, as well as of Greek intellect, to Athens Protagoras came as a teacher. He was born at Abdera in Thrace, birthplace also of Democritus, in 480 BC, and began to teach at Athens about 451 BC, and soon acquired great influence with Pericles, the distinguished leader of the Athenian democracy at this time. It is even alleged that when in 445 the Athenians were preparing to establish a colony at Thurii in Italy, Protagoras was requested to draw up a code of laws for the new state, and personally to superintend its execution. After spending some time in Italy, he returned to Athens, and taught there with great success for a number of years. Afterwards he taught for some time in Sicily, and died at the age of seventy, after about forty years of professional activity. He does not seem to have contented himself with the merely practical task of teaching rhetoric, but in a work which he, perhaps ironically entitled Truth, he enunciated the principles on which he based his teaching. Those principles were summed up in the sentence, Man, by which he meant each man, is the measure of all things, whether of their existence when they do exist, or of their non-existence when they do not. In the development of this doctrine, Protagoras starts from a somewhat similar analysis of things to that of Heraclitus and others. Everything is in continual flux, and the apparently real objects in nature are the mere temporary and illusory result of the in themselves invisible movements and minglings of the elements of which they are composed. And not only is it a delusion to attempt to give a factitious reality to the things which appear, it is equally a delusion to attempt to separate the supposed thing perceived from the perception itself. A thing is only as and when it is perceived. And a third delusion is to attempt to separate a supposed perceiving mind from the perception. All three exist only in and through the momentary perception. The supposed reality behind this, whether external in the object or internal in the mind, is a mere imagination. Thus the Heraclitian flux in nature was extended to mind also. Only the sensation exists, and that only at the moment of its occurrence. This alone is truth, this alone is reality. All else is delusion. It followed from this that as a man felt a thing to be, so for him it veritably was. Thus abstract truth or falsity could not be. The same statements could be indifferently true or false, to different individuals at the same time, to the same individual at different times. It followed that all appearances were equally true. What seemed to be to any man, that was alone the true for him. The relation of such a doctrine as this to politics and to morals is not far to seek. Every man's opinion was as good as another's, 
if by persuasion you succeeded in altering a man's opinion you had not deceived the man his new opinion was as true to him as the old one persuasiveness therefore was the only wisdom thus if a man is ill what he eats and drinks seems bitter to him and it is so when he is well it seems the opposite and is so he is not a wiser man in the second state than in the first but the second state is pleasanter if then you can persuade him that what he thinks bitter is really sweet you have done him good this is what the physician tries to do by his drugs this is what the sophist tries to do by his words virtue then is teachable in so far as it is possible to persuade a boy or a man by rhetoric that that course of conduct which pleases others is a pleasant course for him but if any one happens not to be persuaded of this and continues to prefer his own particular course of conduct this is for him the good course you cannot blame him you cannot say he is wrong if you punish him you simply endeavour to supply the dose of unpleasantness which may be needed to put the balance in his case on the same side as it already occupies in the case of other people it may be worth while to anticipate a little and insert here in summary the refutation of this position put into the mouth of socrates by plato in the theotetus but i ought not to conceal from you that there is a serious objection which may be urged against this doctrine of protagoras for there are states such as madness and dreaming in which perception is false and half our life is spent in dreaming and who can say that at this instant we are not dreaming even the fancies of madmen are real at the time but if knowledge is perception how can we distinguish between the true and the false in such cases shall i tell you what amazes me in your friend protagoras what may that be i like his doctrine that what appears is but i wonder that he did not begin his great work on truth with a declaration that a pig or a dog-faced baboon or any other monster which has sensation is a measure of all things then while we were reverencing him as a god he might have produced a magnificent effect by expounding to us that he was no wiser than a tadpole for if truth is only sensation and one man's discernment is as good as another's and every man is his own judge and everything that he judges is right and true then what need of protagoras to be our instructor at a high figure and why should we be less knowing than he is or have to go to him if every man is the measure of all things socrates now resumes the argument as he is very desirous of doing justice to protagoras he insists on citing his own words what appears to each man is to him and how asks socrates are these words reconcilable with the fact that all mankind are agreed in thinking themselves wiser than others in some respects and inferior to them in others in the hour of danger they are ready to fall down and worship any one who is their superior in wisdom as if he were a god and the world is full of men who are asking to be taught and willing to be ruled and of other men who are willing to rule and to teach them all which implies that men do judge of one another's impressions and think some wise and others foolish how will protagoras answer this argument for he cannot say that no one deems another ignorant or mistaken if you form a judgment thousands and tens of thousands are ready to maintain the opposite the multitude may not and do not agree in protagoras's own thesis that man is the measure of all things and then who is to decide upon his own showing must not his truth depend on the number of suffrages and be more or less true in proportion as he has more or fewer of them and the majority being against him he will be bound to acknowledge that they speak truly who deny him to speak truly which is a famous jest and if he admits that they speak truly who deny him to speak truly he must admit that he himself does not speak truly but his opponents will refuse to admit this as regards themselves and he must admit that they are right in their refusal the conclusion is that all mankind including protagoras himself will deny that he speaks truly and his truth will be true neither to himself nor to anybody else jowett plato four pages two thirty nine and following the refutation seems tolerably complete but a good deal had to happen before greece was ready to accept or plato to offer such a refutation end of section nine section ten of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the sophists concluded gorgias was perhaps even more eminent a sophist than protagoras he was a native of leontini in sicily and came to athens in the year 427 b c on a public embassy from his native city the splendid reputation for political and rhetorical ability which preceded him to athens he fully justified both by his public appearances before the athenian assembly and by the success of his private instructions to the crowds of wealthy young men who resorted to him he dressed in magnificent style 
and affected a lofty and poetical manner of speech which offended the more critical but which pleased the crowd he also like protagoras published a treatise in which he expounded his fundamental principles and like protagoras he preceded it with a striking if somewhat ironical title and an apothem in which he summarized his doctrine the title of his work was of the non-existent that is of nature and his dictum nothing exists or if anything exists it cannot be apprehended by man and even if it could be apprehended the man who apprehended it could not expound or explain it to his neighbour in support of this strange doctrine gorgias adopted the quibbling method of argument which had been applied with some success to dialectical purposes by zeno melissus and others his chief argument to prove the first position laid down by him depended on a double and ambiguous use of the word is that which is not is the non-existent the word is must therefore be applicable to it as truly as when we say that which is is therefore being is predicable of that which is not so conversely he proved not being to be predicable of that which is and in like manner he made away with any possible assertion as to the finite or infinite the eternal or created nature of that which is logic could supply him with alternative arguments from whatever point he started such as would seem to land the question in absurdity hence his first position was he claimed established that nothing is to prove the second that even if anything is it cannot be known to man he argued thus if what a man thinks is not identical with what is plainly what is cannot be thought and that what a man thinks is not identical with what is can be shown from the fact that thinking does not affect the facts you may imagine a man flying or a chariot coursing over the deep but you do not find these things to occur because you imagine them again if we assume that what we think is identical with what is then it must be impossible to think of what is not but this is absurd for we can think of such admittedly imaginary beings as Scylla and chimera and multitudes of others there is therefore no necessary relation between our thoughts and any realities we may believe but we cannot prove which if any of our conceptions have relation to an external fact and which have not nor thirdly supposing any man had obtained an apprehension of what is real could he possibly communicate it to anyone else if a man saw anything he could not possibly by verbal description make clear what it is he sees to a man who has never seen and so if a man has not himself the apprehension of reality mere words from another cannot possibly give him any idea of it he may imagine he has the same idea as the speaker but where is he going to get the common test by which to establish the identity without attempting to follow gorgias further we can see plainly enough the object and purport of the whole doctrine its main result is to isolate it isolates each man from his fellows he cannot tell what they know or think they cannot reach any common ground with him it isolates him from nature he cannot tell what nature is he cannot tell whether he knows anything of nature or reality at all it isolates him from himself he cannot tell for certain what relation exists if any between what he imagines he perceives at any moment and any remembered or imagined previous experiences he cannot be sure that there ever were any such experiences or what that self was if anything which had them or whether there was or is any self-perceiving anything let us imagine the moral effect on the minds of the ablest youth of greece of such an absolute collapse of belief the philosophic scepticism did not deprive them of their appetites or passions it did not in the least alter their estimate of the prizes of success or the desirability of wealth and power all it did was to shatter the invisible social bonds of reverence and honour and truth and justice which in greater or less degree act as a restraining force upon the purely selfish appetites of men not only belief in divine government disappeared but belief in any government external or internal justice became a cheating device to deprive a man of what was ready to his grasp good faith was stupidity when it was not a more subtle form of deceit morality was at best a mere convention which a man might cancel if he pleased the one reality was the appetite of the moment the one thing needful its gratification society therefore was universal war only with subtler weapons of course protagoras and gorgias were only notable types of a whole horde of able men who in various ways and with probably less clear notions than these men of the drift or philosophic significance of their activity helped all over greece in the promulgation of this new gospel of self-interest many sophists no doubt troubled themselves very little with philosophical questions they were agnostics know-nothings 
all they professed to do was to teach some practical skill of a verbal or rhetorical character they had nothing to do with the nature or value of ideals they did not profess to say whether any end or aim was in itself good or bad but given an end or aim they were prepared to help those who hired them to acquire a skill which would be useful towards attaining it but whether a philosophy or ultimate theory of life be expressly stated or realized by a nation or an individual or be simply ignored by them there always is some such philosophy or theory underlying their action and that philosophy or theory tends to work itself out to its logical issue in action whether men openly profess it or no and the theory of negation of law in nature or in man which underlay the sophistic practice had its logical and necessary effect on the social structure throughout greece in a loosening of the bonds of religion of family reverence and affection of patriotism of law of honour thucydides in a well-known passage thus describes the prevalent condition of thought in his own time which was distinctively that of the sophistic teaching the common meaning of words was turned about at men's pleasure the most reckless bravo was deemed the most desirable friend a man of prudence and moderation was styled a coward a man who listened to reason was a good-for-nothing simpleton people were trusted exactly in proportion to their violence and unscrupulousness and no one was so popular as the successful conspirator except perhaps one who had been clever enough to outwit him at his own trade but any one who honestly attempted to remove the causes of such treacheries was considered a traitor to his party as for oaths no one imagined they were to be kept a moment longer than occasion required it was in fact an added pleasure to destroy your enemy if you had managed to catch him through his trusting to your word these are the words not of plato who is supposed often enough to allow his imagination to carry him beyond his facts about the sophists as about others nor are they the words of a satiric poet such as aristophanes they are the words of the most sober and philosophic of greek historians and they illustrate very strikingly the tendency nay the absolute necessity whereby the theories of philosophers in the closet extend themselves into the marketplace and the home and find an ultimate realization of themselves for good or for evil in the business and bosoms of the common crowd it is not to be said that the individualistic and iconoclastic movement which the sophists represented was wholly bad or wholly unnecessary any more to again quote a modern instance than that the french revolution was there was much no doubt in the traditional religion and morality of greece at that time which represented obsolete and antiquated conditions when every city lived apart from its neighbours with its own narrow interests and local cults and ceremonials greece was ceasing to be an unconnected crowd of little separate communities unconsciously it was preparing itself for a larger destiny that of conqueror and civilizer of east and west this scepticism utterly untenable and unworkable on the lines extravagantly laid down by its leading teachers represented the birth of new conditions of thought and action adapted to the new conditions of things on the surface and accepted literally it seemed to deny the possibility of knowledge it threatened to destroy humanity and civilization but its strength lay latent in an implied denial only of what was merely traditional it denied the finality of purely greek preconceptions it was laying the foundations of a broader humanity it represented the claim of a new generation to have no dogma or assumption thrust on it by mere force physical or moral i too am a man it said i have rights my reason must be convinced this is the fundamental thought at the root of most revolutions and reformations and revivals and the thought is therefore a necessary and a just one unfortunately it seems to be an inevitable condition of human affairs that nothing new however necessary or good can come into being out of the old without much sorrow and many a birth pang the extravagant the impetuous the narrow-minded on both sides seize on their points of difference raise them into battle cries and make what might be a peaceful regeneration a horrid battlefield of contending hates the christ when he comes brings not peace into the world but a sword and men of evil passions and selfish ambitions are quick on both sides to make the struggle of old and new ideals a handle for their own indulgence or their own advancement the pharisees and the judases between them make the advent in some of its aspects a sorry spectacle a reconciler was wanted who should wed what was true in the new doctrine of individualism with what was valuable in the old doctrine of universal and necessary truth who should be able to say yes i acknowledge that your individual view of things must be reckoned with and mine and everybody else's and for that very reason do i argue for a universal and necessary truth because the very truth for you as an individual is just this universal the union and identification of the individual and universal 
This paradox of philosophy is the doctrine of Socrates. End of section 10. Section 11 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. Socrates. The sophistic teaching having forced philosophy to descend into the practical interests and personal affairs of men, it followed that any further step in philosophy, any reaction against the sophists, could only begin from the moral point of view. Philosophy as an analysis of the data of perception or of nature had issued in a social and moral chaos. Only by brooding on the moral chaos could the spirit of truth evoke a new order. Only out of the moral darkness could a new intellectual light be made to shine. The social and personal anarchy seemed to be a reductio ad absurdum of the philosophy of nature. If ever the philosophy of nature was to be recovered, it must be through a revision of the theory of morals. If it could be proved that the doctrine of individualism, of isolation, which the analysis of a Protagoras or Gorgias had reached, was not only unlivable but unthinkable, carried the seeds of its own destruction, theoretical as well as practical, within itself, then the analysis of perception, from which this moral individualism issued, might itself be called to submit to revision, and a stable point of support in the moral world might thus become a centre of stability for the intellectual and the physical also. By a perfectly logical process, therefore, the crisis of philosophy produced in Greece through the moral and social chaos of the sophistic teaching had two issues, or perhaps we may call it one issue, carried out on the one side with a less, on the other side with a greater completeness. The less complete reaction from sophistic teaching attempted only such reconstruction of the moral point of view as should recover a law or principle of general and universally cogent character, whereon might be built anew a moral order without attempting to extend the inquiry as to a universal principle into the regions of abstract truth or into physics. The more complete and logical reaction, starting indeed from a universal principle in morals, undertook a logical reconstruction on the recovered universal basis all along the line of what was knowable. To Socrates it was given to recover the lost point of stability in the world of morals, and by a system of attack, invented by himself, to deal in such a manner with the anarchists about him as to prepare the way for his successors, when the time was ripe for a more extended exposition of the new point of view. Those who in succession to him worked out a more limited theory of law, mainly or exclusively in the world of morals, only were called the incomplete Socratics. Those who undertook to work it out through the whole field of the knowable, the complete Socratics, were the two giants of philosophy, Plato and Aristotle. Greek philosophy then marks with the life of Socrates a parting of the ways in two senses. First, inasmuch as with him came the reaction from a physical or theoretical philosophy, having its issue in a moral chaos, and second, inasmuch as from him the two great streams of later philosophy issued, the one a philosophy of law or universals in action, the other a philosophy of law or universals in thought and nature as well. Socrates, son of Sophroniscus, a sculptor, and Phenarity, a midwife, was born at Athens in or about the year 469 BC. His parents were probably poor, for Socrates is represented as having been too poor to pay the fees required for instruction by the sophists of his time. But in whatever way acquired or assimilated, it is certain that there was little of the prevalent culture in cultivated Athens with which Socrates had not ultimately a working acquaintance. Among a people distinguished generally for their handsome features and noble proportions, Socrates was a notable exception. His face was squat and round, his eyes protruding, his lips thick. He was clumsy and uncouth in appearance, careless of dress, a thorough bohemian, as we should call him. He was, however, gifted with an uncommon bodily vigour, was indifferent to heat and cold, by temperament moderate in food and drink, yet capable on occasion of drinking most people under the table. He was of an imperturbable humour, not to be excited either by danger or by ridicule. His vein of sarcasm was keen and trenchant, his natural shrewdness astonishing, all the more astonishing because crossed with a strange vein of mysticism and a curious self-forgetfulness. As he grew up he felt the visitation of a mysterious internal voice, to which or to his own internal communings he would sometimes be observed to listen in abstracted stillness for hours. The voice within him was felt as a restraining force, limiting his action in various ways, but leaving him free to wander about among his fellows, to watch their doings and interpret their thoughts, to question unweariedly his fellows of every class, high and low, rich and poor, concerning righteousness and justice and goodness and purity and truth. He did not enter on his philosophic work with some grand general principle ready-made, 
to which he was prepared to fit the facts by hook or by crook rather he compared himself to his mother the midwife he sought to help others to express themselves he had nothing to tell them he wanted them to tell him this was the irony of socrates the eternal questioning which in time came to mean in people's minds what the word does now for it was hard and grew every year harder to convince people that so subtle a questioner was as ignorant as he professed to be or that the man who could touch so keenly the weak point of all other men's answers had no answer to the problems of life himself in striking contrast then to the method of all previous philosophies socrates busied himself to begin with not with some general intellectual principle but with a multitude of different people with their notions especially on moral ideas with the meaning or no meaning which they attached to particular words in short with the individual the particular the concrete the everyday he did not at all deny that he had a purpose in all this on the contrary he openly professed that he was in search of the lost universal the lost law of men's thoughts and actions he was convinced that life was not the chaos that the sophists made out that nobody really believed it to be a chaos that on the contrary everybody had a meaning and purport in his every word and act which could be made intelligible to himself and others if you could only get people to think out clearly what they really meant philosophy had met her destruction in the busy haunts of men there where had been the bane socrates firm faith sought ever and everywhere the antidote this simple enough yet profound and far-reaching practice of socrates was theorized in later times as a logical method known to us as induction or the discovery of universal laws or principles out of an accumulation of particular facts and thus aristotle with his technical and systematizing intellect attributes two main innovations in philosophy to socrates the inductive process of reasoning and the establishing of general ideas or definitions upon or through this process this true enough as indicating what was latent in the socratic method and what was subsequently actually developed out of it by aristotle himself is nevertheless probably an anachronism if one seeks to represent it as consciously present in socrates mind socrates adopted the method unconsciously just because he wanted to get at the people about him and through them at what they thought he was the pioneer of induction rather than its inventor he created so to speak the raw material for a theory of induction and definition he knew and cared nothing about such theories himself a story which may or may not be true in fact is put in socrates mouth by plato as to the cause which first started him on his search for definitions one of his friends he tells us named chirophon went to the oracle of apollo at delphi and asked whether there was anybody wiser than socrates the answer was given that there was none wiser this answer was reported to socrates who was much astonished his own impression being that he had no wisdom or knowledge at all so with a view to prove the oracle wrong he went in succession to various people of eminence and reputation in the various walks of life statesmen and poets and handicraftsmen and others in the expectation that they would show on being questioned such a knowledge of the principles on which their work was based as would prove their superior wisdom but to his astonishment he found one after another of these men wanting in any apprehension of principles at all they seemed to work by a kind of haphazard or rule of thumb and indeed felt annoyed that anything more should be expected of them from which at the last socrates came to the conclusion that perhaps the oracle was right in this sense at least that if he himself knew nothing more than his fellows he was at least conscious of his own ignorance whereas they were not whether this tale may not itself be a specimen of socrates irony we cannot tell but at all events it illustrates from another point of view the real meaning of socrates life he at least was not content to rest in haphazard and rule of thumb he was determined to go on till he found out what was the law or principle of men's acts and words the ignorance of others as to any such law or principle in their own case did not convince him that there was no such law or principle only it was there he thought working unconsciously and therefore in a way defenselessly and so he compares himself at times to a gadfly whose function it is to sting and irritate people out of their easy indifference and force them to ask themselves what they were really driving at or again he compares himself to the torpedo fish because he tried to give people a shock whenever they attempted to satisfy him with shallow and unreal explanations of their thoughts and actions the disinterested self-sacrificing nobility of socrates life thus devoted to awakening them that sleep out of their moral torpor the enmities that his keen and trenchant questionings of quacks and pretenders of every kind induced the devotion of some of his friends the unhappy falling away of others the calumnies of interested enemies the satires of poets 
and lastly the story of the final attack by an ungrateful people on their one great teacher of his unjust condemnation and heroic death all this we must pass over here the story is in outline at least a familiar one and it is one of the noblest in history what is more to the purpose for us is to ascertain how far his search for definitions was successful how far he was able to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them how far in short he was able to evolve a law a universal principle out of the confused babel of common life and thought and speech strong enough and wide enough on which to build a new order for this world a new hope for the world beyond we have said that socrates made the individual and the concrete the field of his search and not only did he look to individuals for light he looked to each individual specifically in that aspect of his character and faculty which was most particular to himself that is to say if he met a carpenter it was on his carpentering that he questioned him if a sculptor on his practice as a sculptor if a statesman on his statesmanship in short he did not want general vague theories on subjects of which his interlocutors could not be supposed to have any special experience or knowledge he interrogated each on the subject which he knew best and what struck him in contrast to the confusion and uncertainty and isolation of the sophistic teaching in the air was that when you get a man to talk on his own trade which he knows as is proved by the actual work he produces you find invariably two things first that the skill is the man's individual possession no doubt the result of inborn capacity and continuous training and practice but second that just in proportion to that individual skill is the man's conviction that his skill has reference to a law higher than himself outside himself if the man whom socrates interviewed was a skilful statesman he would tell you he sought to produce obedience to law or right among the citizens if he was a skilful sculptor he produced beautiful things if he was a skilful handicraftsman he produced useful things justice beauty utility these three words in different ways illustrated the existence of something always realizing itself no doubt in individuals and their works but nevertheless exercising a governing influence upon these to such a degree that this ideal something might be conceived as prior to the individual or his work or secondly as inherent in them and giving value to them or thirdly as coming in at the end as the perfection or completion of them this law or ideal then had a threefold aspect in its own nature being conceivable as justice as beauty as utility it had a threefold aspect in relation to the works produced in accordance with it as the cause producing the cause inhering the cause completing or perfecting we may therefore conceive socrates as arguing thus you clever sophists when we let you take us into the region of abstract talk have a knack of so playing with words that in the end we don't seem to know anything for certain especially on such subjects as we have hitherto thought the most important such as god and right and truth and justice and purity we seem to be perfectly defenseless against you and what is more any smart youth whose opinion on any practical matter no one would think of taking can very soon pick up the trick from you and bewilder plain people really far wiser than himself by his clever argumentation all going to prove that there is nothing certain nothing real nothing binding nothing but opinions and conventions and conscious or unconscious humbug in the universe but when i go and have a quiet talk with any man who really is a known master of some craft or skill about that craft or skill i find no doubt whatever existing in his mind about there being a law a something absolutely real and beautiful and true in connection with it he on the contrary lives with no other purpose or hope or desire but as far as he can to realize in what he works at something of this real and beautiful and true which was before him will be after him is the only valuable thing in him but yet which honors him with the function of in his day and generation expressing it before the eyes of men have we not here a key to the great secret if each man in respect of that which he knows best because he lives by it and for it knows with intimate knowledge and certainty that there at least there is a law working not himself but higher and greater than he have we not here a hint of the truth for the universe as a whole that there also and in all its operations great as well as small there must be a law a great idea or ideal working which was before all things works in and gives value to all things will be the consummation of all things is not this what we mean by the divine thus socrates despising not the meaner things of life but bending from the airy speculations of the proud to the realities which true labor showed him laid his ear so to speak close to the breast of nature and caught there the sound of her very heartbeats virtue is knowledge thus he formulated his new vision of things 
knowledge yes but real knowledge not mere head knowledge or lip knowledge but the knowledge of the skilled man the man who by obedience and teachableness and self-restraint has come to a knowledge evidencing itself in works expressive of the law that is in him as he is in it virtue is knowledge on the one hand therefore not something in the air unreal intangible but something in me in you in each man something which you cannot handle except as individual and in individuals on the other hand something more than individual or capricious or uncertain something which is absolute overruling eternal virtue is knowledge and so if a man is virtuous he is realizing what is best and truest in himself he is fulfilling also what is best and truest without himself he is free for only the truth makes free he is obedient to law but it is at once a law eternally valid and a law which he dictates to himself and therefore virtue is teachable inasmuch as the law in the teacher perfected in him is also the law in the taught latent in him by both individually possessed but possessed by both in virtue of its being greater than both of its being something more than individual virtue is knowledge and therefore the law of virtuous growth is expressed in the maxim engraved on the delphic temple know thyself know thyself that is realize thyself by obedience and self-control come to your full stature be in fact what you are in possibility satisfy yourself in the only way in which true self-satisfaction is possible by realizing in yourself the law which constitutes your real being virtue is knowledge and therefore all the manifold relations of life the home the market the city the state all the multiform activities of life labor and speech and art and literature and law all the sentiments of life friendship and love and reverence and courage and hope all these are parts of a knowable whole they are expressions of law they are reason realizing itself through individuals and in the same process realizing them end of section 11